wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show. I don't know. That was kind of weak and it was kind of strong, but I'm just going to run with it. So there you go. Uh, welcome to the show. Welcome. Welcome one and all to the show, the big show, the top show, the, the show. I don't know. Why am I doing Barnum and Bailey brothers and circus? Who knows? But we improv the front. So that's what makes it fun, right? Now, see you. Anyway, uh, so welcome to the show. Guys. Uh, I don't even know if I'm going to stick with that in the edit. So if you still hear this part, it, I stuck with it in the edit. So uh, there's the improv. Uh, anyway, guys, we have, of course, the most exceptional guest. This uh, guest we have on today, she is a brilliant author. Eight books. Eight books. We're not going to talk about all of them. We'll have her on uh, probably eight different times to talk about the other books if she wants. Um, but we're going to talk about our latest book that's pretty darn amazing. But in the meantime, we have the special new thing that you can do. It's a special new book club where we talk about the authors that have been on the show. Um, we talk about some of the backgrounds, some of the arrangements, some of the things we discuss that we can. You know, we don't talk about everything, but we, you know, we, we talk about what, what our experience was with the book, how we liked it, reviews, uh, all those sort of different things, things that we learn from the authors and stuff. We talk about that on the book club that we just set up two days ago, patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss. That's patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss. You can get involved. You can have fun. We're going to be giving away books. We're going to be having all sorts of fun. Uh, we'll, we might have some different things going on with authors uh, that we can maybe get roped in to do some stuff with us. But so check that out at patreon.com forward slash Chris Voss. You can also go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss to hit, see the video version of this, um, wonderful podcast that's being brought to you today today and you know whenever you, the hell you're listening to this um and you can also go to the cvpn.show uh, the cvpn.com and tell your friends hey have you listened to the chris foss show.com lately we well, need to because it will improve the quality of your life it uh, it's been shown to help grow hair if you're bald and uh god knows what else i'm just gonna get on with the show really seriously at this point um today our most exceptional guest is Margot Livesey. She is a woman who grew up on the edge of the Scottish Highlands in the grounds of a boys' private school where her father taught. Her first memories are of boys in kilts and sheep. She has taught in numerous writing programs and is the author of a collection of stories, eight novels, including Eva Moves the Furniture and The Flight of Gemma Harding, or Gemma Harding. I think it is, and the Hidden Machinery Essays on Writing. She lives in Cambridge, MA, with her husband, a painter, and on the faculty of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her ninth novel that we'll be talking about today is The Boy in the Field, has just been published. Welcome to the show. How are you, Margot? I'm doing fine, Chris. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to have you because uh, the nice thing about novels, we were talking about this pre-show, the nice thing about novels is, is we don't have to deal with anything, uh, you know, the horrors of what's going on in the news. So we can get into the fiction and that ethereal, that ethereal zone of, of kind of enjoyment and beauty and fun. <laughs> so, so you've written this book. You've written eight books total, which is pretty darn amazing. That's a lot of writing. I'm still working on my first book. Um, so uh, tell us what led you to write this book. Well, writing books is what I do, so I am always I always have my antennae out for uh, possible subjects, things that I think will interest me, but also interest a lot of other people. That's my hope. And a few years ago, I met an old school friend. I hadn't seen him in 40 years, and he described coming home from school one summer afternoon and to this tiny, tiny village where he lived, a village so small that no one locked their doors, picture <laughs> rural Scotland, um, the sheep, etc. And um, at the bottom of his garden, 
he came across the body of a woman who'd been murdered. Oh, wow. And he was only in her presence for probably less than 15 seconds, but those 15 seconds changed his life. Oh. And 40 years later, he described it to me very, very vividly. And the idea stayed with me. I was deep in a novel called The Flight of Gemma Hardy when he told me this. And I wrote it, so I wrote down the idea and I thought, I can do something with this. And uh, in my novel, The Boy in the Field, uh, three siblings, three teenage siblings are walking home from school one September afternoon in 1999, when everyone was worrying about Y2K and not worrying about the things that it turned out we needed to worry about. And um, they find this boy in a field who's been assaulted and uh, they summon help. The boy is saved but each of the three siblings sets off on a, on a separate quest. So it, it's, like the begin, it's like the beginning of a te detective story. Mm. And, and indeed, I do have a detective in, in the novel, but it's not really a detective story in that not a great deal of time is spent on police procedure. <laughs> okay. So, do they, did, so give us a... So uh, so that's kind of the arc of the book, the overview of the book on on what it's about. Does it follow the pathway of the the boys through and how it affects in the short term or their full lives or how, um, where does it move from there? Excellent question. It the book m mostly takes place the autumn after they find the boys. So from 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 September until uh, New Year's Eve, and it follows each of the three teenagers. Matthew, the oldest, becomes a kind of detective figure trying to figure out how to find the boy's assailant. And he also be befriends the real detective who is trying to find the boy's assailant. Oh. Zoe, who's turned 16, goes looking for, some is goes looking for someone who will see her. Um, so she wanders the streets of Oxford. The novel is set in and uh, in and around Oxford, England, and um, looking, I suppose one might say, looking for romance. So that's not exactly what she would say. And Duncan, the youngest, who's 13, uh, is adopted. And he's never previously given much thought to the fact that he's adopted, even though he looks so different from his siblings. Mm. Suddenly, in the aftermath of finding the boy in the field, he really, really wants to find his birth mother. And so, with the help of his parents, he sets out to, to, to look for her, to find her. Oh, wow. So, there's a lot of different uh, stories and, and subcurrents of stories where uh, there, the, the, it begins this journey where they each start following their own path and, and, uh, and of course, the events that, that probably, I'm sure, come from it. Exactly. And in the case of Duncan, um, there was a second sort of origin story for the novel, which is comes very directly from my own life. Uh, after my, my father and my mother both died when I was very young, and from the age of 22, I was convinced I had no living relatives, no one with whom I shared DNA in any mm. meaningful way. And then uh, a, stu a former student was doing research for me on Ancestry.com and someone wrote to her and said, did Eva McEwen have a daughter? And um, I, I wrote to this woman, Gail, and it turns out I have all these relatives. They just happen to be in Australia. Holy crap. <laughs> they went to Australia and, and did she? That's not... <laughs> Cool. Uh, no, all my all my um, grandmother's siblings oh, okay. went to Australia. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't ditch me, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think back in the day they used to ship people to Australia for a certain thing, but I think that was in the eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Like it was a prison colony back in like I don't know what the pre eighteen hundreds or something like that. Yeah. England so, would send people there, so maybe that was it. Maybe they're bad. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sure they're wonderful people. <laughs> 
My, my great grandfather um, was a tailor, and he made kilts. Mm. Um, you know, that's an interesting story. Do you, so, um, this is set in Oxford. Are there boys in kilts running around, or because uh, uh, that's a different area? But um, tell us more about the boys and and kind of what their um, what their experience is. Um, there are no kilts in my novel. No kilts I, in the novel. I now realize this is a, a major... We just lost the kilt crowd. We yeah. just lost the Scottish kilt crowd. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, they just tuned us out. They turned us off and tuned us out. No, that okay. was it. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but I do think some of my um, feeling interest in writing about teenagers and mm. my feeling about how full one's life can be as a teenager, how much is going on in your life as a teenager, how passionately you feel about things, um, comes from growing up in an institution. I didn't, in fact, have very much to do with the boys that my father taught, but, uh -huh. um, but still it was a bit like watching a laboratory of a certain kind. <laughs> I'll, bet. I'll bet young boys are interesting. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting time to go through that age. And and to experience it. So you did you pull a lot of that for for your writing on this book? Your your uh, what what you saw in the boys at your father's school? I, I think mostly actually I consulted the the children of friends. Um, okay. Many of whom were tremendously opinionated about all kinds of things: climate change, politics, work, socialism gardening, reading, um, they had opinions. And it was wonderful to, to talk with people who, I think what struck me was their, their sense of right and wrong and how clearly they felt, no, something's wrong. And if it's wrong, we ought to fix it. <laughs> we ought not just to stand by. Yeah, it's interesting, the innocence and the honesty of, of uh, young people. I remember being principled and having principles like unlike now, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I remember, you know, believing in things so fervently uh, and, and not, comprom not willing to compromise at all on them. Um, but this is interesting. Um, they, so they basically, the three boys, they're walking home. They find the guy, uh, he's bloody and unconscious line of field, and, and they save his life, really, when it comes down to it, right? It's actually two boys and a and a girl. the the middle oh. The middle sibling is is Zoe. Okay, and uh, so I I would imagine uh, so they go on this big quest. Everyone's trying to find out who assaulted this this uh, boy. Uh, they save the life for. Is it the fact that they save someone's life? Is that the real life changing sort of event for them? I think that's life changing to do something so amazing and so powerful. And I think it's also life changing to realize how random life is that thing, things just happen. Things happen for no reason. Bad things happen to good people. And that, that very much violates the world of childhood in a way. I mean, I think we try to convince children that, a plus B does equal C, and um, this finding this boy, uh, he's unconscious when they find him, really sh shakes their view, and in response to that, each of them goes off in a different direction mm -hmm. for something else. And and so they, it, it basically changes their life, and 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 uh, and in an extraordinary way, and kind of kind of wakes them up to life, if you would. That's a very good way of, of putting it. And it was also interesting in the case of Matthew, the oldest, who's 17. You know, I think a lot of detective fiction, it, it makes it look really easy to find who did it. But in Britain, at least, the police report that 50% of crimes are not solved. Wow. So I tried to think about, well, what would it be like if you were a normal person and with limited resources and you were trying to find out who, who, who committed this crime. What yeah. And it looks like they go through several different complications and contradictions. Uh, as they, as they get older, they start to become, uh, more adult. And, uh, 
and find themselves either drawn together or, or driven apart, I guess. Um, and uh, kind of interesting, the, the, the byline here is that it's, it's a, kind of a power of a fable. Is that true? Well, I worry that the word fable suggests something mm. rather reductive, like the tortoise and the hare or the fox <laughs> and the grapes. So there's a very simple message. But I did choose to set it in 1999, partly because I wanted to avoid or evade the mobile phone and our incessant connectivity, and partly to, to talk about a time which, at least in retrospect, seems less troubled than life does nowadays. Mm -hmm. And lastly, because I think children, I mean, children, by children, I mean people under 18, had more autonomy then. Um, yeah. That they actually, in an odd way, had more freedom. And I wanted my three characters, Matthew, Zoe, and Duncan, to be able to conduct their own lives, you know, to go off to look for assailants, to go and look for romance, to think about how to find your birth mother. That That probably makes all the difference in not writing about this age because i mean your story would have been really short it would have been like uh the you know because when i was growing up we went into the fields you know we went in the fields construction projects we wandered we ventured everywhere like everything was an adventure especially wandering through fields and building tree houses and finding finding like little club areas that we could have that were hidden in the woods and you know we grew up in all that sort of thing and you know it, if if you'd written about today it would have been like uh, three three people weren't in the field because they were on Snapchat or playing with TikTok, so they didn't find the guy, and he just died, and that the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or alternatively, they would immediately have dialed nine, dialed the police, and yeah. that would have been the end. And know? they would have went back to TikTok, so you know, and then they would have probably you know Snapchatted some pictures of the 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 poor guy, you know, because that's what people do now. They're just like. Uh, that person's being murdered over there. Let's uh, film them. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, this is the way there's there's a romanticizing a romanticization behind novels and fiction and being able to get it out of our world because it's sure a whole lot more interesting than some of the things we have going on today. That's for sure. Um, so uh, in the end, I suppose they get. I guess suppose we shouldn't blow the ending, but. Uh, uh, they learn a lot about themselves, I'm, I'm sure, and, and uh, as they develop the characters and you see the different pathways and the twists and turns that they go on. Uh, all of that is true. And I would say that the novel in some ways begins and ends like a detective story. Oh. And then in the middle goes in several different directions. But one of the reasons I was really attracted to the idea of detective stories was because the detective is l like the, the person of virtue walking into the valley of shadow, mm. a man or woman of, of, of moral courage descending in, among the, the villains. And that idea and the the kind of order presupposed by the traditional detective novel in which, I mean, when you start a detective novel, you can be really almost 100% sure that the villain will be found, the crime oh. will be solved. And that idea, I, I mean, I play with that idea throughout my novel oh. in, in various ways. But I think we read detective novels both to be frightened and to be reassured. That's true, huh? We're looking for, you know, order in the world. And so uh, you present in the book, you know, some disorder, some disarray, and people find something that changes their life. I've always been, you know, it's, it's an interesting life uh, sort of, uh, what would you call it, format where you, you, you know, I, I, this is one of the reasons I like to have interviews on the show is because I like to see where people go with the forks in their life. There's no one certain way that you have to go through your life. And like you mentioned earlier, there there are challenges that we're presenting with, and and different disasters or or different things that lift us up, and 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 there's so many different ways to choose to go, and you go through life, and it's interesting to see the forks people take, the the paths that they choose, whether they turn left or turn right down a road that takes them on a multitude of of um, 
uh, options and and uh, and I suppose the big thing is just what people what what they learn, whether it's us in real life or whether it's the characters in your book. And I think what you're saying is really interesting because I think we talk about making a decision or making a choice, you, you know, but so often there's a kind of random element in how. Mm. Uh, on how the big how the big choices in our lives get made often the person we end up living with or the university or we go to or the job we get or the bus we catch or and it's a, it's an uncomfortable feeling you know to think that something very significant in your life happens almost by chance that you have so little control and i think my novel the boy in the field is just really interested in that intersection of mm. the purposeful part of ourselves and the part of ourselves that has to acknowledge how much happens by chance. You bring up a great thing. I didn't really address that in my little fork in the road sort of thing, huh? Um, because there are things that happen to you. You can wake up one day and you know you have cancer and then that's a new fork in the road. You didn't you really didn't have a choice. And so, so uh, there you go down the road. Is this your first book with kind of this sort of format of a detective sort of uh, uh, search and, and find yourself sort of a uh, plot? My second, my second novel was uh, called Criminals, and it was about a banker who finds a baby at a bus station, oh, wow. a, a Scottish bus station, and what happens. And again, it, it flirted with the idea of, 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 of a crime, although quite what the crime is is a little unclear. I mean, in a sense, everyone in the novel turns out to be a criminal. <laughs> And um, some people don't return their library books. Some people don't return babies. <laughs> um, and in a, I have in a, that problem. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No. And in a later novel, um, The House on Fortune Street, I have a character who's almost a pedophile. Mm. Uh, uh, he's uh, he's very very drawn to to children and tries very very hard not to act on that attraction. Mm. So I think there's definitely a way in which I think that that bad behavior throws into relief good behavior or or shows us something about life in that's really really interesting. Mm -hmm. I would say nowadays we have perhaps too much bad behavior. <laughs> we do have a lot of bad behavior. If you've seen Twitter lately, um, the uh, or the news for that matter. Um, so this is really interesting. I like how you play with the characters, develop them, and and uh, give them these possibilities and options because I'm sure it makes for some good twists and turns in the story and their lives and their adventure together. Um, and uh, I'm sure it ties up nicely at the end. Um, and uh, what what else do we need to know about the book and what it entails? I mean, what, is there any other little stories or anecdotes you want to give us out of the book? Well, just a couple of things I'd like to add, seeing you're opening that door. Um, Duncan, the sibling who's adopted, who's looking for his birth mother, is an artist. And he's passionately in love with an Italian, with the work of an Italian painter, Giorgio Morandi. And I I wanted Duncan to have a favorite painter, so I went looking for a painter and I read a wonderful uh, essay by the Italian novelist Umberto Eco, who uh, describes how in 1948, as a teenager, his little city in, in Italy held an exhibition of contemporary art and he'd never seen a picture by a contemporary artist before. Mm -hmm. and he fell in love with this painting by Morandi and went every day to visit it for the two weeks the exhibition was on. And I really loved that description of, of a young person encountering art and, and falling in love with art. And I also um, made one of, one of the characters, the, um, a philosopher, um, so that Zoe, um, who's who's looking for someone, who's looking for a way to escape the family, if you will, um, gets to have a, l a little bit of philosophical conversation to talk about ideas of 
cause and effect and um, right and wrong and those kinds of things. But I will say that this is a short novel in which a great deal happens. So I don't spend pages and pages talking about causation. We have a, a, couple, a few exchanges about it and then we move on to something more exciting. <laughs> There you go. Keep it moving, keep it exciting and stuff like that. Um, this is pretty interesting. So um, did, are you going to move on to another novel after this, or is there going to be an extension of this book, uh, maybe where the characters go to the next stage of life, or, or is this kind of completed their stage with the book that you have here? Um, that is such a great and hard question, Chris. <laughs> I've never written a sequel, but I begin to understand why some writers do and mm -hmm. I do remain very interested in these characters so I think they're going to reappear in my work though I may give them different names we shall ah. do, do, do you do that a lot when you write multiple books where you you the, the characters you know sometimes I suppose you would take pieces and parts from different characters and move them to to other books I think it's more like I have certain preoccupations that I keep mm coming back to or things that I'm interested in, um, various kinds of minor criminal activity, um, the effort to make art or why, why we would want to do that, why we struggle to do that, uh, mm -hmm. the power of money in our lives and what a difference having money or not having money makes. Mm -hmm. And also the idea of family, I mean, as someone who didn't have any relatives for 40 years, I have a, a family I adopted whom I'm very close to. So when I did finally meet people to whom I was related, I kept looking at them and saying, so what difference does it make that we're related? And do we both like kiwi fruit? And, <laughs> you know, I, I was really sort of puzzled. I, like, like, I was like a water diviner looking for water. Or, there you go. You know. That sounds like me every day. I go to the fridge and, and get, look for water. I'm uh, <laughs> Mountain Dew, one of the two. Um, that must have been an interesting journey to, to find your relatives and stuff. Maybe that, maybe that could be a basis for the next book where you, where you talk about someone who's been looking for, for their family and the whole experience only you could put it into a different character format other than yourself. And that would be an interesting story. I always wonder about people that, that, that do that. They, they look for their parents. Um, one of my business partners, uh, girlfriends, uh, she had been adopted, put up for adoption at age three. And so, and I don't think she was searching like for a long time to try and figure out who her parents were. I don't know if she ever did, but I know it was kind of a, it was kind of that bucket hole she was trying to fill for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so interesting book. Um, and, uh, and where can people get it? Give us the dot coms where people can look it up and everything else. Well, I have a website, margolivesey.com. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where there are a number of wonderful independent bookshops, Newtonville Books, Porter Square Books, Harvard Square Books, uh, Brookline Booksmith. Um, and I teach in Iowa City, um, where there's a wonderful bookshop called Prairie Lights Books. Um, so I really recommend independent bookshops. And if you can't remember the name of an independent bookshop, then there's something called bookshop.org. And if you go to that, you can buy a book which will benefit an independent bookshop. So you're supporting a, a larger organization of independent bookshops. And I'll refrain from mentioning the obviously very wealthy person um, who, I, who, is a who is a last resort on hopes, but. 
Support your local bookstores because, uh, I mean, even here uh, where I'm at, there's there's these really classic old bookstores, and they're really struggling with COVID-19 because people weren't going in anymore. And they were already, you know, on the edge anyway because so many people don't read so much anymore, and, and they probably should uh, get from what we've seen in the news and everything else. Um, so uh, check out the book. Uh, go ahead and order it up, guys. You can go to all the different wonderful places uh, that Margot mentioned and uh it's the boy in the field a novel um i think you'll find it most excellent uh it sounds like she's got all the experience in writing and stuff like this um and one final question i have for you is uh why is haggis so nasty for the scottish people what's going on there man (laughs) well i hate to break it to you chris but i'm that very rare person a lifelong vegetarian and so I've never eaten haggis, but haggis is actually having a a tremendous comeback in Scotland. And you can go to all kinds of posh restaurants and get haggis wrapped wrapped in phyllo and, you know, haggis and frog's legs. And um, so do not disdain the humble haggis. I think you're going to find it in America very, very soon. There you have it. Uh, Do not disdain the the haggis. yeah, I just figured I'd throw that in there for fun. But seriously, though, if I had seen haggis as a child growing up in Scotland like you did, I'd probably be vegan too, permanently. So, yeah. <laughs> Run for the hills. <laughs> Run for the hills. Well, thanks to uh, thanks to my uh, friend Margot for coming on the show. We certainly appreciate you being here. Um, be sure to check out her book and her other books that she's got there. Uh, you can get them from all the different places. Oh, I'm looking at pictures of haggis here. i got to turn away. Um <laughs> And uh, be sure to follow the ecbpn.com, the Chris Voss Podcast Network.com. You can uh, you can uh, subscribe to the show over there, youtube.com forward chest Chris Voss, and go to patreon.com forward chest Chris Voss so you can see the new book club that we have launched there. Thanks, my audience, for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.